so as I said, today we're going to continue talking about antibodies and uh, hit a bunch of different um, sort of important pieces of info about antibodies. So one of the things that I, that we, you know, we talked about the heavy chain and the light chain. Um, we talked about the immunoglobulin domain last time. We talked about where there were double bonds. We saw the antigen binding areas in the FAB. We saw the FC portion. We saw the hinge. So all sorts of good stuff we saw with our antibodies last time. Um, and I left off uh, telling you about how um, the heavy chain and the light chain together are needed in order to bind antigen. So our antigen is binding and making contacts with both the heavy chain and the light chain. Um, you can see that on my little stuffed antibody. You can also see that on uh, these figures um, where the antigen is sort of binding in this area that is um, being made up by the heavy chain and the light chain. Um, here, you are the antigen, and you're looking down at the antibody like this. Um, and what you can see is that there are places where that antigen is contacting the heavy chain, which is in pink, and the light chain, which is in blue. Um, and this is also a ribbon diagram um, where you can see kind of the antigen and the antibody, and you see that there are connections across both heavy and light chain on that surface. So that's basically what you're seeing here. Um, and so exactly which antigen is bound by any particular um, antibody, again, is all about the combination of the heavy chain and the light chain that is being used. So the heavy chain and light chain will come together and they'll make some sort of unique shape. And that shape will be complementary to the antigen of interest. And so by combining different heavy chains and different light chains, we can get antibodies of different specificities. There is one other thing that I want to point out to you. Um, it's labeled here, but I didn't mention it last time. So. Um, you can also see that we have our immunoglobulin domains here still in our in nice rectangles. And the way that this uh, figure labels them is that some of them have a V on them and some of them have a C. So you can see that the heavy chain has one V and multiple Cs. You can see that the light chain has a V and a C. Um, the V regions stand for variable. So those are known as the variable regions. While the C regions are the constant regions. And so what you should notice is that the light chain has both a variable region and a constant region. The heavy chain also has a variable region and a constant region. Um, that constant region does actually go up into the antigen binding part. It's just the very kind of end where um, we bind antigen, where we see variation with our antibodies. So that's where you know, the antibody against the S epitope, the S antigen, um, and the N antigen of SARS-CoV-2, like you thought about in the lab yesterday, that's where they differ, is they differ in the variable region. The constant region could be the same. There's only those five kinds of constant regions I told you about last time, M, D, G, E, and A. Um, when people have actually then tried to further study the antibody proteins, they have lined up the proteins. So they have taken all sorts of different antibodies and lined up the proteins. And they found that the constant regions are pretty much constant. The variable regions are variable. Shocking, I know. Um, but they also find that if they look at the amino acid positions, and, and here we're just looking at variable regions. We're looking at variable heavy, VH, variable light, VL. If you actually just look in the variable region, some parts are more variable than the others. 
So there are some parts of the variable regions that are really variable. There are three sections in both. So you can see there are these three sections in the heavy chain variable region that are way more variable than all the rest. There are three sections in the light chain variable region that are way more variable than all the rest. Those regions are sometimes referred to as the hypervariable region, or HVR, because they're so variable. They're hypervariable. The hypervariable regions are really important. One of the things that's important about the hypervariable region, I think it was on here, eh, kind of, um, is that the hypervariable regions are actually the three parts that touch the antigen. They're actually the three places that we're touching the antigen quite closely. Um, they are also sometimes known as, instead of hypervariable region 1, 2, and 3, they're also sometimes known as CDR 1, 2, and 3, because they determine what antigen is complementary. So they're the complementarity determining regions. <laughs> they're the things that actually touch the antigen and actually determine which antigen fits. Um, if we, so what you can notice, of course, is that the variable regions are immunoglobulin domains. They're depicted here as rectangles. And if we look at the structure of the immunoglobulin domains, we find that the three hypervariable regions, or the three complementarity determining regions, are actually the three little loops at the top. Um, of this beta pleated sheet. And so those three regions are making up the, these loops. Um, and so the way that these really looks, so you can see here's the immunoglobulin, oops, here's the immunoglobulin domain. Um, you can see the three loops are, la are labeled at the top. Um, and so what I kind of always imagine is you know at the end of my antibodies on both the heavy chain and the light chain there are like these three little fingers almost these three little loops on both the heavy chain and the light chain that are coming together and touching the antigen <laughs> and those are the things that vary and those are the things that actually make the different shape are just those three little loops and so you can see the loops from the light chain and the loops from the heavy chain are actually the things that are reaching out and touching the antigen so they're at the end of <laughs> the heavy chain and the light chain. Um, so those loops are going to, again, become really important. So all of this information that I've told you so far has had to do with how we bind antigen with our antibody. But we also need to think about how our antibody actually gets rid of a microbe. Because again, People often think about antibodies as these amazing superheroes, but they're just proteins. There are an awful lot of functions that a protein can't do um, as much as we would love it to do so. And so now we need to talk a little bit about the antibody effector functions, or the what can antibodies do in order to uh, destroy microbes. Um, this figure from your textbook shows six functions of antibodies. Um, that's fine. There are a few different ways that people divide up their functions of antibodies. Um, and so six, sure, I'll take six. I often have in the past have called it five, but six, six is fine. Um, in fact, this summer, uh, while podcasting, I read a paper where I learned about a new one. So actually, I guess that makes seven. Um, so we're going to kind of talk through what each of these functions are um, and how they work. The really good news is you kind of already know about some of them. So it's going to be kind of easy to understand. Um, because one of the, the first effector function of antibodies that I want to tell you about is that antibodies can fix complement, which is a fancy way of saying start the complement cascade. 
You already saw this earlier this semester when you saw that antibodies can start the um, classical pathway of complement. And so one of the ways that antibodies can get rid of microbes is starting the classical pathway of complement. So easy. Um, the second function is also one that you kind of already know about. So this function is opsonization. Um, so, oops, just like um, if you stick complement on something, that makes it look tasty and makes it more likely to get phagocytosed or eaten. If you stick antibodies on something, that also makes it more tasty and more likely to be eaten. So antibodies are also able to opsonize. So you can see if we have this bacteria with some antibodies bound to it, that makes it likely to get phagocytosed. Um, so opsonization is yet another function of antibodies. When we talked about opsonization and complement, I had to tell you about the fact that um, opsonization meant that there must be some complement receptors so that the phagocytic cell could detect that complement. There must be complement receptors. This should tell you there probably must be some receptors here too <laughs> that are involved. And in fact, that is very true. Um, there are many different uh, receptors in your immune system known as FC receptors that bind the FC portion of antibodies. And so there are phagocytic cells that have FC receptors. If there is an antibody stuck to something, the uh, FC receptor can bind the FC portion and phagocytose that thing. So there are lots of different types of FC receptors. This is going to be a real, real hard one. There are some that are called things like the FC gamma receptors. They bind to the FC portion of IgG because G and gamma are the same. And there's some that are uh, FC alpha receptors, because they bind IgA. And there are some that are FC epsilon receptors, because they bind IgE. Um, so relatively straightforward. The idea is just that we have these receptors that are binding the FC portion. Um, so complement and opsonization are definitely sort of ones that you are pretty, sim pretty straightforward right now, probably the ones that are pretty easy for you to understand. Um, the next one I also find to be pretty easy to understand, um, though it's not one that we've talked about thus far this semester. It also is in a lot of ways my personal favorite. And the reason why is because it's the one that people who work about viruses talk about all the time. And it's the one that when people are, say, making vaccines against viruses, they spend all their time thinking about. Um, but I promise this one's very easy to understand. So this function is called neutralization. Um, so on the left, you can see um, a general example with no neutralization. <laughs> so here you can see there's a virus. It is binding to some receptor on the cell, getting into the cell, doing its thing, right? That's how viruses work. If, however, we are in the presence of neutralizing antibodies, those antibodies are able to bind to the virus. So note that here the antibodies are binding to the antigen and blocking the virus from being able to interact with its receptor on the surface of cells. So basically, the virus cannot interact with its receptor because the antibody's in the way. So you need to have this specific interaction for the virus to get into cells. The antibodies just bind and get in the way, so the virus can't do this process. Um, and so very frequently, this is really important to stop viruses from getting into cells. This is kind of what our goal is with a lot of uh, vaccines against different viruses. Um, and here you can see kind of the 
general idea as well. You know, here's a cell. It has a particular uh, uh, receptor. Um, so the receptor is on the cell. The receptor is not on the virus. It binds to a particular protein, this blue protein. And antibodies, which are shown in green, could blind, bind to that same blue protein and thus make it so the virus can't bind to the receptor. Some people are like, oh, the antibody binds to the receptor. Mm, antibody binds to the virus, so the virus can't get to the receptor. In a lot of ways, neutralization is fancy steric hindrance that you've learned about in chem. It's just steric hindrance, but we're calling it a fancy immunology name. The Im antibodies are just in the way. Um, sometimes they can bind to the exact identical site that binds to the receptor. So they could bind like right here and block this interaction. Sometimes they can actually block a, bind a little further away, but just literally get in the way and not let the interaction be close enough. Um, and so it really is like a fancy steric hindrance kind of thing. Um, this is the thing that virologists very frequently think about in terms of antibody functions. Um, but it also is really important in lots of other situations, um, particularly in um, the case of some bacteria that cause disease by, giving, by producing toxins. Um, the toxin hurts your cell by getting into the cell and binding some receptor. And antibodies can also neutralize those toxins so they can't get into your cells. Um, and so it's the exact same process uh, of toxin neutralization. The um, bacteria that you saw um, in the von Behring and Kitasato experiment uh, last time all act by toxins. <laughs> and so the reason why antibodies were the answer in that experiment was because of toxin neutralization um, that was actually happening. So um, neutralization is a pretty important one. It's also a pretty uh, straightforward one. Um, this is the one that everyone thinks is dumb. And everyone's like, why does this even a thing? Why does this even get to count? This seems like the most useless function I've ever heard. Um, it's not all that, it's not completely useless. And it's very similar to something I told you about with the techniques yesterday. Um, so this is called the formation of antigen antibody complexes. You could also kind of say that it's like precipitating or something like that, the antigen. I generally just talk about it as complex formation. And the idea here is if you get a whole bunch of antigens and antibodies that come together at just the right concentration, they make a clump. <laughs> they come out of solution. And so we start to get these big higher order complexes. This is really good because it now means that the antigen isn't floating around doing stuff. It's sort of caught up in this clump. Um, and very often, when those clumps are made, they may get phagocytosed <laughs> and cleared out of circulation. Um, antibody antigen complexes can also be bad in some situations because they can do lovely things like clog your blood vessels when they clump or clog your kidney tubules or clog other places. Um, so, but in fact, just pulling the antigen out of solution so that it can't continue to act is an important way that antibodies can um, block some sort of microbe. Um, the other two functions have something in common. And they have something in common actually with a function I've already told you about. So these two plus the new one I learned this summer, plus one I already told you about, all have something in common. And the thing that they all have in common is that they all involve an FC receptor. And they all involve a cell with that FC receptor. And the cell with the FC receptor does a thing. So you already saw one example of that, which was opsonization. Um, there are some people who now use the phrase antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis when they mean opsonization. Um, so if, you happen to, if we ever happen to come across antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis, it's opsonization. But 
so everything we're going to see in the next on uh, the next couple slides are there's an FC receptor on a cell. The cell recognizes the antibody using that FC receptor, and then the cell does a thing. Um, and so whether we say these are all different functions or the same function, I don't really care. Um, but that's what they all have in common. So this is the one that cracks me up whenever I talk about it. Because I'm going to talk about it on this slide. And you're going to say, Dr. Barker, I don't understand all the details. There's a lot of, I have a lot of questions. And I'm going to say, right now, I care that you can like define these words. <laughs> and I know that you don't understand it all and I have a lot of questions because there's more stuff that will be helpful. And then later in the semester, I'm going to be like, OK, guys, remember the words we learned? And you're going to be like, what words? There were words. Words happened. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know how many years I've been teaching this class. And every time I get to that later lecture, people are like, we heard of this before? What? <laughs> I promise you did. You heard of it right now. <laughs> um, and so this function is called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, or ADCC. Um, that other weird optimization name is sort of paralleling on this. The idea here is that we have a cell. In this case, it's an NK cell. The NK cells have FC receptors. And so if those FC receptors bind to antibody um, on the surface of some cell, the uh, NK cell will kill the cell. NK cells are natural killer cells. They kill things. And so, the, so you can also kind of think about ADCC or the activation of uh, this process as just being a way we turn on NK cells. So if uh, antibodies are bound to the surface of some cell type, the NK cell can use its FC receptor in order to kill that cell type. And you don't need to worry about any other details other than knowing that this is what ADCC is, and it's one of the functions of antibodies. <laughs> Um, similarly, there are other cells with FC receptors, like mast cells. Mast cells are full of granules. Those granules contain things like histamine and other things that are relatively toxic. If we have um, an antibody that binds to those um, mast cells, then the mast cell will release the contents of its granules. And so here you can see a mast cell before and a mast cell after, <laughs> where it has lost all of its granules. You can also see a drawing from your textbook of the mast cell before and the mast cell after. Um, the stuff in these granules is pretty toxic, and the idea is that this is a way that you can deal with big microbes, like worms, that you can't phagocytose. Basically, you throw toxic bombs at them. It is basically what you do. Unfortunately, my body likes to throw toxic bombs at pollen because mast cells are also the main causative agent of a lot of your, aller your allergy responses, which is why you have to take an antihistamine to stop the stuff in the toxic bombs. Um, but this whole thing is happening because of antibodies binding to the surface of that uh, microbe and that triggering the NK cell. And so the idea here is this function of antibodies is that we can activate NK cells um, to release their contents. Um, the function that I read about this summer that I didn't really know a whole lot about beforehand is apparently there are some FC receptors um, on neutrophils, and that can make neutrophils release their nets and lead to neutrophil mitosis. And so it's kind of the same thing. It's that the FC receptor gets engaged, the cell throws stuff out. <laughs> um, basically the same general process. Um, so this seems um, pretty straightforward, pretty good. But now we have to add one other piece onto this. And this is something that we're basically going to sort of talk through for the rest of the time today. 
um, which is that um, we've talked about variable regions and the fact that they vary in terms of our ability to bind antigen. I told you that there were constant regions and there were five different kinds. But what I haven't told you is, that, is what's actually different about them. What's unique about those five different constant regions? And so what I'm going to do for the rest of the time today is talk about the five different isotypes of antibodies and what's useful or important about them. And sort of like, what are the important facts about each of them? One of the reasons why we, have to, why we do it this way is because one of the things that differs about some of them is that some of them are really good at one of the functions. And so, when I, so I, in talking about this, I'm going to be referring back to those functions I just told you about, um, because the functions are one of the places where these uh, differ. Um, so let me do this in the other order. Um, so officially, right now, we are talking about isotype differences. So two antibodies, say an IgE and an IgG, are of different isotypes. They have, so you can see that the whole constant region of the heavy chain differs between them. Um, we can also talk about other differences between antibodies based on differences in heavy chains or differences in who they are from, um, though we're going to get more into that later. But one other piece of information. Those of you who have more of a sort of biochem background are going to really dislike what I tell you on the next slide. I promise you it will make sense. Right now I'm telling you about an observation that people made before they knew biochemistry. And now that you, now you know biochemistry, you're going to be like, no, -uh, that's not how things work. It does. There's a way that it makes it work. I promise I will give you all the details. Right now, I need you to know it exists. <laughs> Even though I'm not going to tell you how it works, and you're going to get mad. Again, I've done this a couple times. We can have situations where we have the same variable region, the same antigen binding with different constant regions. So in fact, at different times, we can have our immune response switch. We can bind to this, anti uh, this antigen with IgM. And at a different part of the immune response, we can actually have that same antigen be bound with an IgG. This is called class switch. Um, and so we can see the predominant type of antibody that is being made in a response switch. Um, so you might first respond to, to say, SARS-CoV-2 by making an IgM response. Later on, you will make an IgG response. So we can have class switch. So it actually matters that these different antibodies do different things. You might switch to have one that is better suited for that particular microbe. There, is, there also has been an observation um, that over time, the uh, binding strength of uh, for antigen changes, so it gets better um, over time. This is called affinity maturation. So the antibodies actually do change over time throughout the response, both in terms of uh, involving different constant regions, um, as well as having a stronger binding. We will get into the details of that. If someone has burning desire to know, we can talk about it after class. All right, so our goal here is to talk through the, some of the unique parts of different isotypes. Um, so this is a table from your textbook that we're going to be coming back to oops, a number of times. Um, so what I want you to notice are, in general, some of the things that vary from isotype to isotype. So you'll notice that we see the molecular weights. We see which heavy chain is used. We see the um, levels in the serum, so how much of this is found in your blood. Um, 
as well as how long this lasts in the blood. That's the half-life. And then we see some information about functions. You can also notice that there are more than five isotypes shown here, because there are a few different types of G. There are a couple different types of A. For our purposes now, we're going to lump them all together. Um, we aren't going to focus too much on the different subtypes there. Um, and the first one that we are going to talk about is IgM. So if you look at this table about IgM, what seems to be unique about IgM? Where does IgM seem to stand out compared to the others? Yeah, Rishi. Molecular weight. Look at the molecular weight of IgM compared to all the other ones. IgM is huge. Um, and in fact, that is true. Um, because IgM exists as a pentamer in most cases. What that means is that there are five antibodies five identical IgMs all linked together with a J chain or a joining chain. So this antibody doesn't float around by itself. It floats around with its four twins. Quadruple, quintuple, whatever. Quintuplets, yeah. <laughs> um, so in fact, IgM doesn't usually have two binding sites for antigen. It has 10 in this form that it's usually found in, in the body. So you can imagine that kind of gives it a little help in its uh, ability to bind to antigen. It's actually good because it hap IgM tends to be found before we get that improving thing <laughs> in the response. So it's kind of weak, needs a little help. So one of the things that's most important about IgM is that IgM is always found as a pentamer. And this is really important for its um, avidity. This also really impacts on functions that IgM can do. Um, so if we look at kind of the functions of IgM, you can see that there are some things that it can do kind of meh, OK. But the place where IgM is awesome is that IgM is awesome at turning on the classical pathway. IgM is amazing at fixing complement. The reason why IgM is so good at fixing complement is that when it's in its pentamer form, it can bind to 10 copies of antigen and have FC portions at a really special angle that's perfect for C1. Basically, we get the FCs in exactly the way, the formation that C1 wants. And so IgM is really the big complement fixer um, because of this structural aspect. Um, so that, yeah, there are ways that some of the other ones can fix complement, but they kind of have to look out in making the right structure. IgM makes the all-star fabulous structure to fix complement. And so that's really what we use IgM for. Um, so I'm actually going to do these in an order that's not kind of the classic order. But this order, I think, makes more sense, at least to me. Um, so the second one I'm going to tell you about is IgE. Um, IgE is my nemesis. Um, so if we look at the data on IgE, where does IgE seem to stand out? Yeah, Jen. Yeah, if we look at the normal serum level, it's really, really, really low. It's because IgE doesn't hang out in the serum. It spends its time somewhere else. Um, and it spends its time in a very particular place. IgE 
spends its time bound to mast cells. So mast cells specifically have an IgE receptor. They don't have any old FC receptor, they have an IgE receptor. And all of your IgE right now is bound to your mast cells. Just waiting to see antigen and give you allergies. At least if it's mine. Because it's I'm allergic to like outdoors. So all of my IgE, just like all of your IgE, is right now not floating around free in the serum. It's stuck to mast cells. And IgE is the only isotype that can trigger mast cells. And so mast cell activation only happens because of IgE. Um, and so, mass, so IgE is all about mast cell degranulation. Um, I tell you about that um, as a little bit of a segue into the next isotype. So I've been showing you um, details uh, from about uh, each isotype from, in a table from your textbook. And I'm going to do that for IgD. But I, I want to first show you this version, which is from the previous edition of your textbook. So this is the past, the previous version of your textbook's view of IgD. What stands out about IgD here? There's one very special thing about IgD here. Yeah, Sebastian. Yeah, it has no function. And for most of my life, the, my definition of IgD was no known function. <laughs> um, we can use it actually to mark some developmental states um, of B cells, but other than that, it does nothing. Since I have been teaching this class, we have found a function for IgD. Um, though there is relatively little known about it. So what we now think is that IgD turns on mast cells in the same way that IgE turns on, or sorry, IgD turns on basophils in the same way IgE does mast cells. So we said IgE went with mast cells, IgD seems to go with basophils. Since there are so few basophils, it's very hard to study this and really understand what's going on. And so we don't really know a lot about what the deal here. Um, but that's currently what people think the function of IgD is. But in the past, the answer was it has no known function. It's an evolutionary relic. No one cares. So that's IgD. That's the only, uh, literally, you now know pretty much my entire life's knowledge about IgD. Um, so the next one that is uh, pretty interesting is IgA. So IgA is one of the important ones. All right, so if we look at the info for IgA, um, anything in particular stand out about IgA? Yeah, Jamie. Yeah, so the thing that is really important about IgA um, is actually the, its body location. It's not that it has a, any particularly cool functions. Um, I will tell you that most of the time when we talk about IgA, we talk about it neutralizing. Although it was the one that was in that paper I told you about before with the neutrophils in the nets. <laughs> I, when I think of IgA, I usually think of neutralization but it's not the only one that can neutralize. Lots of them can neutralize. The thing that's really unique about IgA is where in the body we find IgA. There's also one other thing that is sort of unique about IgA, and that is that there seem to be two forms of IgA. One of them is just the standard old IgA form, the one with the normal molecular weight. The other is secretory IgA, which is found as a dimer. So some of your IgA hangs out original, like by itself as just plain old IgA, <laughs> monomeric IgA. Um, other IgA is actually in a dimer, 
where you have two IGAs uh, held together with a J chain. Um, and I will admit that um, one of my podcast co-hosts um, is an IGA expert, and that we've been having a lot of conversations. We've been talking about IGA a bunch, and I think I underestimated. I used I was kind of thinking like 100% of IGA looks like this. <laughs> Um, and I underestimated the fact that it's like some is like this and some is monomeric, um, which she has sort of corrected me on. So do not think 100% of it is like this. <laughs> um, but this IgA is able to bind to a specific receptor um, that does something really cool called transcytosis. So IgA, like any of your other um, antibodies, is made by a B cell and is made in the blood. But when IgA binds to this FC receptor, what happens is that it gets taken into a cell in a little vesicle, held onto really tightly, and then put on the other side of the cell. It basically gets like a free ride across the cell. Um, it's not, you know, modified. It's not degraded or anything like that. It basically just gets moved across this layer, this wall between the blood and mucosal areas. And so IgA is found in secretory um, parts of your body. It's found in all your mucosal areas. And so here you can kind of see this as well. Um, so. Um, if you don't have any IgA, you'll have lots of microbes. Here we're in the pharynx. So this is the part where the air goes and the breathing goes. <laughs> and there's some bacteria there, and that's sad. But in fact, in reality, you have IgA there. And the IgA can actually neutralize and block those microbes from being able to get into cells. So you have a lot of IgA throughout your respiratory tract, but especially in the nose. You have IgA um, in your GI tract. You have G IgA in your um, urinary and genital tract. You have IgA in your eyes. You have IgA in your tears. Um, basically, all of your mucosal areas are full of IgA. And you can almost think of IgA as like part of a barrier organ. It's like an antibody that's acting before the thing even gets in, really. It's like it's acting when you're in the the foyer, <laughs> not like fully into the body. Um, and so you can see um, the anatomic locations of IgA here as well. So you can see that we've got I monomeric sort of throughout the body, but we particularly have dimeric IgA um, in all of these different um, mucosal compartments that are shown in yellow. In addition, IgA um, is able to transcytose into the breast milk. And so IgA is also found in breast milk. Um, and so if um, a mom uh, breastfeeds, then she will be giving IgA to the baby. Um, potentially, you know, before the baby is making their own IgA. So it's pretty cool because then it, basically mom is giving the baby a little bit of immune experience to anything that she, mom, had previously been infected with. It's not going to be long term. We're not transferring cells that can make IgA. We're transferring some of this protein. It's going to eventually degrade, so the baby's only maybe going to be protected for a few weeks. But it's a few weeks of protection that the baby wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, and so um, this is kind of where we see IgA. There's also one other really important or one other sort of really interesting thing about IgA, which is that there is a disease called selective IgA deficiency. Um, selective IgA deficiency is the most common immunodeficiency. Um, and in selective IgA deficiency, you don't make IgA. Um, you can see some of the, uh, the frequencies of this in different populations. Um, so this is how many per million individuals um, have selective IgA. Um, so you can see this ranging from almost 7,000 per million um, in a Saudi Arabian population to 60 per million in a Japanese population. 
Um, so it is entirely possible that you are sitting here right now with selective IgA deficiency and don't know it. Um, these individuals seem to be healthy. Um, so we really don't see much in the way of um, issues with individuals with selective IgA deficiency. There are some questions that maybe they have lung, some chronic lung disease um, in countries with more air pollution, but it's not like super clear data. Maybe there are some in changes in frequency of celiac disease, but nothing like really obvious, whereas a lot of our other big immunodeficiencies are really obvious. Um, also, just to note, immunone deficiency means some part of your immune system is missing. Autoimmune disease means it's too much. So autoimmune disease is too much immunity, immunodeficiency is too little. Um, and it's possible that people are healthy with this because um, of modern hygiene, that we're just sort of not seeing as many microbes. But there's also another piece to this. Because when we look at these sorts of numbers, we say, man, this is way more common than a lot of other immunodeficiencies. Why is it that all the people with this don't die? Why is it not only that all the people with this don't die, all the people back in prehistoric times who had this didn't die, so that we still have their kids around today? Why was this not selectively removed? Why was there no selection to remove this from the gene pool? And there's an important idea about what's going on here. Let's imagine that you, ha you do not make IgA. When are you most likely to die of infectious disease? Yeah, Abby? When you're a baby. When you're a baby. When your immune system isn't, you know, you don't have a lot of immune experience, you don't have a lot of immune memory, you know. When you're a baby is actually when you're most vulnerable to infectious disease. Well, it doesn't matter if you make IgA or not when you're a baby. It matters whether or not your mom makes IgA because you're getting your mom's IgA through breastfeeding. And so it seems as though there doesn't seem to be the same kind of, there really doesn't seem to be a selection. And this may be also why it seems that most people with this seem pretty healthy in the modern world. Um, and so um, it is entirely possible, like I said, that you may have uh, selective IgA deficiency and be sitting here all good. Um, so the other isotype that is really important is IgG. So what stands out here about IgG. Let's see, Justin. It's four types, absolutely. We got lots of things to stand out here, so four types, definitely. What else? Yeah, Sydney. There's a lot of it in blood. It's the one that's most frequent and most common in blood. Yep. Crosses placenta. Crosses placenta. So we're going to come to that. Hannah, what were you going to say? Okay, Danny. So it binds to FC receptors. So we got lots of things going on with Ig, or with IgG. IgG sticks around for a really long time. It's the one that's in your body for a long time, and there's the most of it. We know the most about IgG because it's the one that's really easy to get. If I try to take your blood, I'm going to get tons of IgG. I'm probably not going to get a lot of some of these other ones. IgG, there's boatloads of. Um, the four different IgG subtypes are shown here. What you should notice is that they largely vary in the length of their hinge. Um, and so that changes things like how flexible they are. It also changes things like do proteases cut them very much? You can look at IgG3. It has a super long hinge. Proteases cut it all the time. And so it doesn't stick around in your body as long as the other ones. Um, and so that's kind of where we tend to see um, the big differences between the IgG types. So there are lots of things that are important about IgG. One of them 
Um, and one of the ways I think very frequently about IgG is its timing. Ig, so when immunologists think about making an antibody response, and in general, the antibody responses, there's something that we always remember, which is that we've got these five isotypes, right? And those five isotypes are like this. That's your five isotypes. I, I told you I use the mnemonic, MDs give everyone apples. It's not actually just to help me remember what the five isotypes are. But in fact, this is actually the order of some important genetic pieces related to them in the genome. And very loosely, this is the order in which they are made in an immune response. Yeah? OK. Um, so M is always made first. Some of these other ones are made later. Really, it's kind of like there's a dividing line there. M and D are made pretty early. The other ones are only made late. Of the ones that are made kind of late, late, IgG is way more frequent in the blood. Remember how frequent it was in the blood? And so one of the reasons why IgG is really important is that we use IgG to tell us how far into an immune response we are. We measure, are you making IgG or not? Um, because at the very beginning of an immune response, you will largely be making IgM, which is shown here in black. And then you can see that an IgG response kind of comes up a little bit later. Um, and if you are actually sort of later, or if you're making any kind of secondary or memory response, that's an IgG response, not an IgM response. So as you saw yesterday, one problem with an antibody test is that it doesn't tell you if your immune response is current or past. It just told you that it ever happens sometime. If we start trying to see, well, is that an IgM response? Or is that an IgG response? We can get a little bit more information of is that, are we in a secondary response? Or are we kind of later making a good response? Are we earlier? And so that's one. If we really wanted to, we could get the same, I could make the same graph with IgA or IgE. But they're hard to measure. And IgG is really easy to measure. <laughs> so we measure IgG. <laughs> get this kind of pattern. So IgG is indicative of the timing very much of the response. Um, it is also found in many different um, body locations. Although what, what I want you to notice here is that you don't see it quite in the mucosa as much as you see you know, the IgA. IgA is really mucosal. I'll get to that and a reason why I'm pointing that out in a second. Um, IgG also is the only isotype that can cross the placenta. And so when we have a fetus uh, in utero, it is not yet making it's much in the way of its own antibodies. And its only antibodies are the ones that are coming across the placenta from mom. Um, they are all of the IgG isotype. Um, it does this because of, again, another FC receptor that will move the, uh, the um, antibodies across the placenta um, into the baby's blood. Um, so it's a very similar type of transcytosis um, across a tissue layer. And that FC receptor only binds um, IgG, and so only IgG is going to be found in the baby. And so this is an additional thing that's going to protect that baby early on. Um, in fact, um, you can see that um, here's birth. These are kind of 
antibody levels. And you can see that before birth, our baby mostly only has IgG from mom. You can also see that that IgG eventually goes away because we're just transferring antibodies. They're proteins. They degrade at some rate. We're not actually transferring any cells to make more of them. The baby's got to make their own cells. So the baby's only protected um, for, you know, from those antibodies for a short period of time. Um, if mom was breastfeeding, which is not shown on here, we'd also have some transferred IgA. You can see the baby doesn't make, really start making much of their own of some of these antibodies until um, you know, a little bit later. You can see maybe six to nine months. Um, so I have a question for you. Now that you have seen this information and you know this information, let's imagine that one of the things you desperately want to do is you want to protect babies from infectious disease. You want to make sure babies have really good immune responses against different infectious diseases. When are you going to give the baby a vaccine? Yeah, Justin. OK, a year or two. Why do you say a year or two? So you're saying here? Yeah. Okay. Abby, what were you going to say? Probably six to six to year. Okay. Okay. Yep. So, so usually, in fact, we give a whole bunch of vaccines around six to nine months. <laughs> and the reason is because we want that baby protected the minute we can protect them. We don't want them to even go, like, very long at all without protection. So as soon as mom's antibodies are going away, we want to make sure that we're getting those babies protected. If we give them any later, then the baby went some time with no protection. If we give them any earlier, mom's antibodies are going to in interfere. Um, this is one reason why people get really like angry about why do kids get so many vaccines all at once. It's because we want them protected right away. Um, so I have another question for you. There is an infectious disease called pertussis, also known as whooping cough. Whooping cough is especially deadly in infants. Um, you can find, I do not recommend, all sorts of case studies of like six-week-olds dying of pertussis. It's really, really bad and really, really ugly in very small infants. How are you going to protect infants against pertussis? Yeah. Vaccinate mom. Why vaccinate mom? Yeah, and so the CDC actually within the past 10 years has changed the pertussis vaccine recommendations so that now um, moms get a pertussis vaccine in addition to the ones they've had elsewhere in their lives in their third trimester, specifically so they can make antibodies to give to the baby. Specifically so they can make sure that that baby gets IgG transferred through the placenta and gets protected early on. Um, and so um, there are lots of ideas about how we can use this information in order to make sure that we are protecting babies well um, against uh, different diseases. And so I know a number of people who are working on pediatric vaccines um, who are specifically looking at ways to immunize moms uh, in order to deliver antibodies to babies um, to try to deal with problems like this. Um, one downside of this whole thing is that if someone has an autoimmune disease that is an antibody-related autoimmune disease, so some autoimmune diseases involve antibodies that are causing damage, um, and a woman has one of those, she can actually pass those antibodies to her baby, and the baby can be um, born with some issues. We now know enough about this that we can actually block that transfer, or we can try to remove some of those antibodies from mom um, so that we don't have this transfer. Um, but it is theoretically possible that passive antibody transfer can transfer these antibody-mediated autoimmune diseases. So I guess that's a bit of a downside of this whole problem process that I'm telling you about. Yep, Jamie. Um, so if we prevent the transfer of the antibodies from mom's baby because mm -hmm. of one of those conditions, 
Mm-hmm. Is the baby born with a, a much lower immune like antibody level? Or no, the baby's usually okay. Um, the baby's usually okay. Um, so one other piece of info that I just want to point out, because it's, again, it's relevant to everything we're talking about right now, and it is um, also one of the questions that I have been answering all the time lately, um, has to do with antibody isotypes. So remember that I told you about IgA and the fact that IgA is often found in mucosal sites. Um, and also remember that I have kind of implied, at least, that different stimuli give you different types of antibodies. So some things might give you a good IgA response. Some might give you a good IgG response. Some might give you a good IgE response. You can, you can, buy, you can go with me on that, and we can talk about the mechanisms of that later. So here we have a person, beautifully drawn by Sydney, good job, Sydney, who has a nose and who has lungs. Um, what antibodies are you going to find in the nose of this person? Yeah. IgA is largely going to be in the nose because that's a mucosal site. What antibodies are going to be in the lungs? Hmm? I can't hear. Yeah, Hannah? IgA. IgA. Anything else? Remember, it's not totally drawn here super well, but know that the lungs have a lot of blood. <laughs> yeah? They also have IgG. So your lungs have both A and G. Um, your nose mostly has A. So what it, we, one thing we have seemed to notice is that in particular, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines are really good at inducing IgG. They're okay at inducing IgA. So that means if a person is vaccinated, they've got the lung antibodies, not the nose. I cannot repeat Sydney Strong. If, so this is, if they are unvaccinated or uninfected, they got done, right? Some people wonder, why, can you, why is it possible? Why are some people getting infected with this virus but not having any symptoms after they get a vaccine? It's because they don't have any protection in their nose. They don't have any IgA. So the virus gets in their nose, tries to party, needs to go to the lungs to give symptoms, but we got lots of IgG in the lungs. And so if the virus ever makes it to the lungs, bam, it's neutralized and we have no symptoms. But we could still have a teensy bit of virus in the nose because of this difference between IgA and IgG. All right, um, I'm gonna tell you something really quick, and then I'm gonna put up something funny that you don't have to sit through, because I know it will go slightly after my time. Um, so we are going to deal with, start talking about a problem in immunology um, on uh, Monday, it's really gonna take us Monday and Wednesday. This is a problem known as the diversity problem and I'll introduce the diversity problem more to you on Monday. Um, the diversity problem involves us talking about how we get antibody diversity. How, we, how many um, different types of variable regions are there and how the heck does that happen? It involves a bunch of genetics. For some students, this will be the hardest topic we talk about this semester. If, any time you do the reading before class, please do the reading before class for Monday, Wednesday. It's the same reading for both days. The Wednesday day is particularly the more detailed day. I very much remember the first time I learned this topic as an undergrad, and I was like, why does my awesome teacher, who I really like, suddenly start speaking Swahili in the middle of class? Because I don't know what any of these words are. So please read it so you've, heard, so you've seen the words before I say them, because it'll make more sense if you've sort of had some experience with them. And now, as you are packing up, um, there is an excellent science communicator. Her name is Raven the Science Maven. Um, she actually communicates largely on TikTok. Um, but she has made uh, a song about antibodies. 
um, that cover some of the information that we're talking about. So I'm going to play her song for you as you are packing up. Um, I cannot hear, she cover, she's doing a cover of another song that you'll know, and I cannot listen to that song now without hearing this. So that's what I have to say about antibodies, um, and I will see you on Monday. <laughs>